Going to begin, we've got a session this afternoon. We've got two, two talks, one who is totally going to happen in this room, and then one is coming live from North Carolina through the magic of the tubes, and we'll see if we go 0 for 3 on live demos uh, for the day. I think it'll work. Mike, Mike's usually pretty good. He can computer. Um, we have one session after that with three more, and then we'll have a reception this afternoon, and we'll be halfway there. So I will introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Arthur Newton. Can you see the screen? No. Let's try that again. All right. Welcome, everybody. I don't have my name. Oh, your name's not up there? No. All right, so this afternoon, uh, we're going to have two speakers. The first is Arthur Newton from Surfsara. His title is Asynchronous File Handling with IROD's Tape Resources. Am I? Can everybody hear me? I hear myself, at least, so that's nice. Uh, yes, thank you. I'm Arthur Newton from Surfsara, as, as I was introduced. I'm an advisor in the Data Services Unit at Surfsara, so my job is kind of... Uh, uh, helping researchers with their research data to manage every data solution that we have at Surfstara and basically helping them. Today I'll be helping you through the lunch dip. So it is always uh, the first talk after lunch. I hope people haven't eaten too many tacos and are still fresh for these talks. Uh, my talk will be uh, mostly about a tool that we've created, about uh, the topic of last year that we did at, uh, North Carolina, at uh, UGM from Matthew Song. And this will be a follow-up. Um, yeah, so actually, the fact that I'm presenting this is a bit weird because I haven't developed this tool. So it was developed by, actually by a uh, software developer in our, in our group, but he's in a camper in Norway, so that's also nice. Uh, but I will be uh, yeah, telling about this tool, asynchronous file handling. And uh, you can immediately go to the GitHub, or you can first listen to me and then gradually uh, get, it, get to know the tool. Um, yeah, so very, in one sentence, what Surfsara is, probably a lot of you already know, but Surfsara is a Dutch high-performance computing center uh, supporting Dutch researchers via, uh, well, first of all, services, but also training and consultancy. So especially the last two are, uh, are my, uh, my uh, job. As of yesterday, actually, this was presentation was uh, at a uh, foresight. As of yesterday, we have an official service, a storage scale-out service, uh, for every uh, university that has an IROS instance. So, uh, for instance, uh, Utrecht and uh, Maastricht and a lot of Dutch universities are um, uh, setting up their RDM platform with IROS and using uh, resources from Surfsara, so either normal disk storage, object store, and of today's talk will be a data archive you can use this, the R resources, to make a more scalable data infrastructure for your own university premise. So the idea is, I will explain what the idea is later, but that you simply can use R storage but still administer your own IRLS instance. So for those of you who don't know, the, the Surfside Data Archive is actually a service we already have uh, and it's used a lot. Uh, it's also used for uh, CERN, uh, data from CERN, it's used for data from LOFAR. Lots of data on there already. And uh, the idea is that you can have both online data and offline data, right? Where online is first on a disk cache on tape, and then there's a tape robot reading in data from the, the cache and then transporting it on tape and then locking it up somewhere. And then it's really offline. But the nice thing is that the you can still see your data, just not the bit stream. Uh, and our and the topic of last year's talk was really how did we connect this data archive to IROTS? How can people that have their own IROTS instance use our, the tape archive as a storage resource? So instead of all these different people logging in immediately on the archive and then using the data there, how does that go th through IROTS? Well, I will be mostly recycling last, uh, last year's talk, but I guess that's fine. Uh, so how does it work? IROT does not really immediately have the concept of offline data. You have to kind of build this in. Your, uh, build this in. 
uh, it was a bit of before my time, but uh, you, you could use a compound resource where one is a cache and then as a cache resource and archive resource. But after some testing, we kind of found out that this was uh, not that efficient and was a bit, uh, some issues arose. Uh, instead, we made it a little bit easier. We just used an, uh, un a normal Unix file system resource, just like I was always, always knows, and connect this and have an NFS connection from this uh, resource server, Unix file system server, to the, immediately to the disk cache on tape. In this way, the handover of the data is more transparent. It's nicer because uh, our data archive, which is managed by DMF, uh, makes sure that the inode is still visible. So all the data, all the iCAT still can see the data. And you can, as long as you're working with the metadata, you're making different collections, you're moving data around, it's still all fine. If you need a bit stream, then you need to do uh, net, therefore the, uh, to solve this, we have, have to add something. I'll show you later. But it's already uh, putting data on there is already uh, then kind of solved. And the way it looks like, how it looks, it's like this, where you have your own Arrow zone in orange. It's just you. Um, you have Unix file system as a resource server. And like I said, there's an NFS connection directly on the disk cache of tape. And then when it's on that Unix file system, a DMF kind of uh, uh, manages whether it, the data is on the disk cache or on tape, basically. And then IRLTS only know, and then IRLTS knows if it's offline, and you, you have to let IRLTS know that it's offline or online. Um, but the nice thing is IRLTS can directly look into the Unix file system of the tape disk cache and can query the, the, the tape directly for feedback. And like I said, you have to add a bunch of rules for to make it truly transparent that you can also get data back from the tape because maybe typically the tape is of course for data that you know that you're not going to touch for a while but of course we also realize that you want your tape uh, back and I think also uh, Paul our uh, previous speaker has a lot of experience with uh, how we have to deal with this um, but the rule basically is this so when, you want, when someone wants to access a data object, the PEP gets triggered, and then you have to basically ask the question, is it on archive, or if no, it's easy. You just continue. If it's yes, you have to query the state of the date, data, if it's offline or online. And then, if it's offline, interrupt the service, because otherwise, what happens is that IRLT will ask three times per second on data archive, hey, can I get my data, can I get my data, can I get my data? And that's something that the data archive people will, yeah, will hate you for. So uh, we quickly did not do that. <laughs> so we, let the, we interrupted the process and basically what the, um, and tell the user, like, hey, I'm sorry, it's not there yet. But that's actually also exactly where the problem is. So on a technological level, we managed to connect the archive to iWorlds and everything kind of works. But yeah, you still have this very much this asynchronous behavior of offline and online. And then uh, you still need to explain then to the researcher, hey, your data is offline, you cannot use it. You, the, the researcher still needs to understand a lot how a tape archive kind of works. So it's something you want to actually abstract away from. So when we, well, previously, when uh, you got this, he did I get and then test, you got a big error message, and then in the end you saw some, okay, your data is being staged. So being sta so that there's actually a, tape, a robot arm getting your data somewhere and trying to put it on the dis discussion that you can actually retrieve it. And then you, there's some percentage sign. Uh, but you have to continuously do an I get if you, uh, yeah, to, to, get the to get the status of data. And especially if you want to work on the high performance computing center, uh, high performance computing uh, systems. It's a bit annoying if you have to create some, uh, well, it doesn't, just doesn't work in your workflow. So, uh, so like I said, especially if researchers will directly access the data, it becomes very annoying because you either have to, uh, well, teach researchers how a tape archive works, but this is also something you don't want necessarily, right? 
This is an issue with your data archive to begin with. And this issue will become more and more urgent because we got a better price point, basically, of the surf tape storage. It, we expect, because of, because of kind of the data sizes exploding and much more data coming in, tape will become, our, our tape system will become more and more uh, populated with data. So people will actually use it more actively. So for researchers to be able to handle their data more conveniently, even though it's this asynchronous uh, state, having offline and online, we need a better way than this error message, basically. So, and we also, I, I think it's also a nice opportunity to create a dedicated nimble data handling tool. So, mouthful. But uh, I think it would also be very beneficial to create a dedicated tool for this data handling, because, uh, of course, uh, the I comments are also there, but I commands are not uh, built in to know what's offline and online, right? We either have to build that into the I commands or but that's also as an issue. But I think it's also a nice opportunity to have an, a dedicated tool for the researcher, right? That you, uh, that can also handle this asynchronous behavior of data. And this tool should then also be more easily incorporated into workflows, workflows already existing, uh, that workflows that data researchers already work with. Um, yeah. In comes iArch, and uh, this is a disclaimer. Uh, iArch, I just had to think of a name for this presentation because I didn't want to say asynchronous and uh, all the time. So it's just iArch is just a name for today. And if there's better names, please uh, please tell me. Is it named after you? Uh, well. Unfortunately, you did find out uh, immediately uh, the reason why I call it iArch, no. <laughs> yeah, so if you want a better name than a name that's named after me, please come to me uh, with feedback to get a better name. So this is uh, what we uh, thought up, uh, came up with, is a command line application that is also, uh, people using our HPC system are also familiar with the command line, so that's, we are safe on that part. Uh, we want to make it easier to download and upload this data irrespective of the state of data. It uh, uses the IRLT Python client. This kind of makes it also easier, uh, I believe, so for uh, using on all operating systems. I actually don't have that much experience with uh, Windows. So I hope for the Windows users that it's indeed true that the IRLT Python client is indeed, uh, you can actually use the IRLT Python client on Windows. Who uses Windows? Wow, a super, super nice crowd. Uh, well, well, it will all work for you. So uh, that's uh, nice to know. Uh, <laughs> so the application is, uh, in the end, is split. And this is also where the crux is. So it's split in a bunch of CLI tools and a daemon-like application. Uh, and the daemon, and the, actually the daemon kind of handles the asynchronous, what you have to do to handle the asynchronous behavior of the data. So it makes it kind of easier for the researcher to work with data that's on tape. And of course, the, the daemon is automatically spawned on your, on your own machine if you initiate one of the, the commands to get the data back or not. So um, yeah, that also makes it easier. So it's kind of an over, overview of the command. So it is a very small utility still. Yeah? It's also what we wanted. We wanted a small dedicated tool. Of course, we can extended, but at first it's just the minimal, minimal things that it needs to do. So the DMI config, basically is an I init uh, alternative, you just may have to make a connection to your IRLTS instance. Right now, this IRLTS instance needs to be connected to the tape archive. So you need to have an archive resource. It's, it doesn't work yet for every resource. It's maybe something that we can do for the future, but right now, your IRLTS instance needs to be connected to the tape. And we'll also only see those items. There's an I daemon, which is kind of it's more for debugging process, uh, debugging purposes right now, just to start and stop the daemon. And there, well, there's an I list, and I get, and I put, and they all work with this daemon, and then the daemon in the end handles your requests. So it's kind of your data handling becomes more of a sending in jobs, like hey, I want my data, and then the daemon handles that job for you. So. Uh, to get a bit more overview of the, the, the comments. I, I, I wanted maybe to do a demo, but it, using a live demo with tape is very uh, difficult 
because you can also wait for uh, 50 minutes to get your data back, right? That's tape. So uh, yeah, I didn't do that. I, I was thinking about doing a mock, like a mock tape, but I didn't want to lie to you. So, so that's why I didn't do a demo. Uh, so you can do an iconfig, which initializes the connection. Well, that's fixed for itself. You have an iList, and it actually shows you all the data objects that are on the tape archive. And it also shows you the uh, kind of the history of how you handled your data. So on the left side column, you see the DMF state. It's the dual, which means that it's online and offline. So it's getting both in cache and on tape. You can also have it only offline, only online. And I think migrating is also uh, a state. You have a bunch more, but they are not really important. Uh, you have the time of date when you did the thing. Well, it's uh, not that special, but you also have a, a status bar where it shows you how far your data is back being able to retrieve. Of course, it's not like the, the amount of meters that the robot is on its way to the disk cache, but it's really about the disk cache to your local machine. And it also says the, the mode that it was doing, so either the get or the put as of now. And where the file was on the IRLS level and on the local level. And if you haven't touched the files, you don't have this extra information, but you do have the, the state of the file. Uh, you can have an I put, of course, which that was actually already fixed, of course. The, the I commands didn't need to know about asynchronous behavior if you put the file. So that's, well, that's easy enough. But especially the get, get now it just works. You can just do an I get of the file, and then the daemon takes care of the asynchronous behavior. And if you want to know how far you are, you can uh, uh, you get the, uh, the status from this uh, object via I list. So you know how far it is. So you can actually also monitor. Or, uh, well, it's also the I get also has an option, of course, that you can do this. So, so you can monitor more easily how far your uh, state is. Uh, so in large parts, this is already the utility. And this is also uh, kind of my talk already. But um, so it's very minimal as of now. But I think it does solve a lot of problems for researchers handling tape archive and really uh, hopefully in the future where they will become more and more important. It's also something we can actually use on our HPC systems. So uh, future plans mostly are, are also increase the functionality. Like I said, it can be a dedicated tool for researchers handling their data. I think a crucial part will also be querying for your data in a way. That's maybe also uh, easier than the iQuest uh, command, which can be difficult for researchers to understand because you have to need to know a bit how I will store some metadata. Um, I also want to abstract a bit further from the offline and online part, where right now it only works for the resource which is an archive, but I also actually want to have just all your data. And we also have different types of uh, hard disks coming, which have zero watt uh, hard disk. Basically, you turn off a hard, hard drive, and if you want the data, you turn on the hard drive. So, uh, so there's more of these concepts uh, coming in. So I just want the researcher to not care about these resources anymore, but just to have a concept of, okay, your data is offline and online, depending on your university's policies, and you just let the daemon uh, handle this request. Uh, I hope soon to implement it in our HPC system. This should also be a bit easier than uh, installing the iCommands. Uh, and please uh, go to the GitHub page and uh, help uh, Stefan uh, further with uh, developing this tool. Uh, that's, uh, that's about it. So uh, credits were credits to Stefan. Basically, the nice thing, that he, uh, this was basically his first project, getting to know how to uh, work with IRLs and work with a Python client. And then we decided, well, if you make this tool, you'll probably learn IRLs a lot. So this is basically his first uh, small project. Uh, Sharif, uh, mostly tester, and of course, Matthew also for uh, giving me the slides of last year, uh, and also for testing a lot and testing the performance. And that's about it. Thanks. Any questions? Uh, yes. Throw it. Okay. You how about this? It was, it was close. Yeah. I didn't go for close. Uh, small question. Yeah. You got to pay uh, attention. Basically, if I understand it correctly, you, you have. Uh, Simplify the error message handling and yeah. so on uh, by, by making it a bit asynchronous. But the researcher still has to see whether his files are all there. 
Yeah, so we're, it. yeah, that's true. Did, yeah. Did you, did, you, did you have in mind some facility that you could, let's say, send them an email when a bunch of files are online? We could also do that. Uh, mostly, I'm, um, so this, this tool is pretty new, and um, so we are looking also for a lot of researchers to actually test it out. And uh, so I, all these nice stories, but actually <laughs> uh, to have a few researchers who have, uh, are IRL savvy and also using the HPC systems. Uh, hopefully, to get this uh, feedback will be nice. Yeah. Of course, sending the email is uh, a possibility. I think Paul, I'm going, uh, I'm going across. Mom. Right, everybody look at me. Everybody look, no, you know, everybody look at, look at everybody uh, look at Russell me. And see the ball coming. Come on. <laughs> you need uh, to uh, yeah, work away so with your. Uh, um, yeah, sorry, Paul. I was wondering if you had looked at the new storage steering plugin. I know ah, Matthew yeah. looked at the, the previous iteration of it, but I'm not sure yeah, you looked true. at the new yeah. one. Yeah, so that the storage steering plugin can actually retrieve the files as well. Uh, yeah, that's true. But does it also give you more communication on where, where your files are? No, no, it doesn't solve th that issue. No. Um, so that's true. Also, maybe a combination of using the storage steering plugin could also help. But yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can look into that. Yeah. And maybe a second question, if I. But, oh yeah, this is also, by the way, considering that, we also maybe considering like people own. We also have a connection from uh, the, uh, our HPC system directly to archive. And you could also maybe solve this where you don't necessarily have a storage steering. Yeah. Because storage steering plugin, of course, works if you go to a different resource, but doesn't work for the disk cache. And I yeah, but friend. maybe the disk cache itself could be part of the tiers. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah, yeah. If yeah. you would have a native DMF yeah, 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 resource exactly. plugin. Yeah, yeah, could be nice. That would, that would be solve also a lot of things. Yeah, if, if it's but the that's source. that's a more serious. Uh, yeah, uh, if, it, if it's the source, then it could be tier zero, and then you could just yeah, yeah. always keep a copy there, or never. You could potentially make it part of the answer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the second question, if you have... Uh, you or Matt, you have any new insights in handling small files on the tape? Uh, well, not uh, not really. <laughs> so maybe uh, we, we uh, at least Matthew told me there's a. They are of course always always looking for solving this issue, having small files on tape because mostly the you don't want any small. I don't know if everybody knows, but uh, you don't want s small files on tape, and you especially don't what you especially don't want is people retrieving individual small files from tape, because then your tape uh, robot uh, will hate you. But um, and small yeah, we are thinking about solving this with uh, different technology, yeah, different, different type of hardware, that you don't necessarily store your f small files on tape, but some, on some other medium, but we're not there yet. So. OK. Would, would, would solve a lot of uh, world problems. Yeah. Um, okay, who's going to catch the microphone? Anybody? Nobody oh, wants the microphone. All well, right. Paul, you have to ask questions for the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's thank uh, Arthur. <laughs>